Good afternoon. How you, how's everybody doing? Feeling good? Good, good. This mashed potatoes getting you all in a nice cozy spot. Lunch was great. I, uh, I really loved it. It was good. Um, we are in our final stretch here. Uh, we're going to go and have a few more sessions in this room. And of course, the sessions going on in uh, Coast Live Oak. Uh, but otherwise, we're going to do that. And then we're going to wrap up at the end uh, at 345. But I'm super excited by all the sessions. And I'm super excited uh, about this next one as well. So right now, we've got Michael and Nico from Cruise. They're going to talk about building self-driving cars with Basil. So. Hey everyone, thanks for showing up to this. Uh, I'm Michael. I'm Nico. Uh, and we're software engineers at Cruise. Uh, so if you don't know about Cruise, uh, we're a self-driving car company based in San Francisco. If you live in or work in or if you've visited SF in the past year, you've probably seen one of our cars uh, in the wilds. Um, they have our name on it and they also have fun little names like Piglet or Tofu. Um, but today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we put the software on those cars, or rather how we build the software for those cars, um, and how we've used Bazel to optimize uh, that whole process over the past couple of years. So first I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the unique challenges we're up against with developing software at Cruise. Um, so like most companies, we're building software that goes on servers but those servers move. And they carry people inside of them. And we're driving in the real world where there are pedestrians, bicyclists, motorcyclists, other cars. Uh, and we're doing this in San Francisco. Uh, and if you've ever driven in San Francisco, frankly, if you've ever walked on a street in San Francisco, uh, you know it's not a fun place to drive. Uh, but because it's not a fun place for a human to drive, we think it's a great place for a robot to learn how to drive. We also have some fun problems that arise just from the software itself. Our code is mostly C++. There are no de facto build or dependency management tools, so you're kind of on your own here. It's the Wild West. Uh, it's a complex language, so naturally the tool, tool chains are complex. We support both Clang and GCC. Uh, some teams have different needs. Uh, integrating with any build tool takes some patience. Also, because of what our code does, uh, we need to make sure it's as safe as possible. Part of that involves running a lot of analysis tools, both static and dynamic. Uh, the dynamic analysis comes in the form of sanitizers. Uh, and the w unfortunately, the way these work, you can't enable them all at once on the same runs, so it effectively multiplies the amount of work you have to do in things like CI. Uh, we also use machine learning so that the car can make sense of the world around it. Uh, this has extra hardware requirements in the form of GPUs. Uh, GPUs aren't available in the same quantities as things like CPUs or typical VMs in the cloud, so we have to be a little bit smarter, and this causes heterogeneous environments in CI, uh, then causes the need to do more test sharding and make sure we're directing tests to the right things. We're also a growing company with a growing code base. That creates even more problems for us. Compared to two years ago, we have about 10 times as many people. Uh, those people write more code, because that's what they're hired to do. Uh, we spend five times as much CPU time to build everything now. Even with all of that, we've still managed to make build times about six times faster. Uh, so the goal of this talk is to shed some light on how we've managed to accompli accomplish this. We did this with a team of four engineers, too. It's our hope that if you're just starting out with Bazel or if you're facing any of the same problems, that you can find something useful here. So we have a few sections to, to cover in this talk. First, we're going to talk about how we got in this mess in the first place. Uh, Nico actually helped, uh, or actually did all of that for us. Uh, so it's gonna, he's going to talk about what it took to migrate us to Bazel. Then we're going to shift gears and talk about how we actually measure things. The, the whole point of this is you know, improvement and making things faster. Uh, so we think it's valuable to show you how we actually, actually measure that. Um, it's our way. It's one way. Uh, but hopefully, you can find some value in it. Lastly, we'll talk about some of the key things we did to actually make the builds and tests faster. OK, thanks, Michael. Uh, yeah, so I'm here to tell you the story of 
how and why we migrated to Bazel in the first place. And uh, so the fact is on a robot, you can never have too much CPU, so you want your code to run as fast as possible, which means that at some point you end up using C++. C++ is really slow to compile. Like a single file can take like three or even five minutes, depending on like the libraries you use and how complex the code is. Uh, which meant that like on a developer workstation, and we use powerful workstations so that people can run simulations, can do all the 3D visualization and stuff like that. And still like two years ago, we like, yeah, one fifth of the code we have now, it still took one hour to build the code. So I've seen people like do crazy stuff. Uh, they had like the morning ritual, you set up the, the build and then you go grab coffee, maybe go to the bank. Some people had like a nightly script that like at 3 a.m. every night will like pull master, build, and then they, when they get to work, everything is already built, hopefully. Um, so this is not really great. And the reason we wanted Bazel was to take advantage of caching, basically. We didn't really care about all the fancy correctness features, multi-language support, or anything like that. We just wanted the builds to go faster, basically. And uh, Bazel actually delivered. So this is not my picture. I stole it from the internet. But we set up a, a workstation under my desk as a remote cache. And that basically cut down like a master build from like one hour to basically five minutes or something like that. Um, that's it for stories. Um, how did we actually do it? Um, the main problem when doing a migration like this is that you want engineers to be productive while you're basically moving things around underneath them. Uh, so we had this magical script uh, that would basically parse uh, the CMake files we had and create corresponding build files for Bazel. So we never thought anyone to write build files uh, they, they kept writing CMake files, and then in CI, we would basically convert them to build files. And of course, the, the script was magic. 800 lines of Python, they would basically just take the, the syntax tree for CMake, do a bunch of like heuristics and stuff like that. It wasn't pretty, of course. Um, after a few months of work using like, uh, tools like this, uh, we had the first PR uh, to enable Bazel builds in September 17, so a little over two years ago. Um, so once the first, say, 80% of the work was done, as always, you're basically left with the other 80% of the work. Um, for C++, uh, this meant basically baselifying the build of like 100 or so third-party dependencies uh, instead of just importing them from the Ubuntu installation. Um, for us, this polishing work took roughly two more months, uh, basically, for our code base. And during all of this, we had a bunch of education to do. Basically, people were changing their daily workflow. And this is like our now lead developer on the team uh, that discovers that like Skylark is not actually Python, and you can't actually use the standard library. Um, so the idea during all this time is that we had both uh, CMake and Bazel builds uh, working at the same time on the same code base. And developers could choose to use either. So basically, we have some early adopters, you have some laggers, but both work. And if we found any bugs or missing features, we could always tell people to like, uh, go back to CMake for like a day or two while we fix the bug, and then they could come back to Bazel. And um, so after, say, so four, five, six months of work, uh, when people came back from the holidays after Christmas 17, all the CMake files were like gone from the repo. I think this is. 275 files deleted, and um, we have been happy users ever since. So just to recap a bit, um, at the time the company had roughly uh, 200 engineers. Uh, I counted like um, 3,000 C++ files, like 1,000 Python files, and 300 CMake files, which is like one over three, like makes you think very hard. And um, so that basically the migration took roughly like six months uh, of basically just me from like start to where we could delete all the CMake files. Um, we have seen like many stories of migrations. I also want to share what I think we learned. Um, the fact is, uh, don't underestimate the human factor. So early on, uh, we decided on a goal. We wanted to make local builds as fast as possible. We ignored everything else, basically. We didn't care about CI. We didn't care about correctness. We just wanted to get the, the local build, the workstation build number down. Um, and that basically gave us the early wins uh, to basically push the rest of the, the basil with us. Um, we didn't break the existing builds. We didn't break existing CI. 
um, until we were confident that basically was at, Bazel was at parity. And like a bunch of uh, like customized tool, tooling helped a lot be, because we could basically port changes over from Bazel over to, uh, from CMake over to Bazel automatically. And finally, like, um, I encourage you to resist the temptation to like improve things as you're doing a migration like this. Um, it's not the right time to clean up technical debt. And I mean, of course, uh, uh, I found lots of like skeletons in the closet, but we just ignored them and like went on with the migration. It's much easier to like clean things up once you're like 100% basal. Um, so th back to you, Michael. Thanks, Nico. So let's fast forward a bit to late 2018. Uh, we're still happy with Bazel. Uh, that's why we're here. Uh, but we need to make things faster, and we're not exactly sure where to start. So before we can even think about improving performance, we need a way to measure it. After all, you can't really improve what you don't measure, and this whole talk is about improvement. So the initial metrics that we care about aren't particularly surprising. Uh, we, of course, care about build time. Our number one objective is to lower this number. Uh, we talk about it every day. It's the first thing we bring up when reviewing weekly metrics with other teams. And most importantly, it's the first thing developers notice when they run builds or don't notice if their builds are already fast. Uh, luckily, you get more blame than praise, uh, so you hear things pretty quickly. Uh, but we can't just measure end-to-end -end time. Uh, knowing how long builds take, especially over time, is indeed how we want to measure our impact. But without knowing where that time goes, we're just dealing with a black box. So we're also already using remote caching. Uh, it's the main way we make our builds faster. So of course, remote cache operations are important to us, and we need to measure them somehow. However, we began to suspect that tests in CI were actually rebuilding things that were cached in builds immediately prior. Um, not a great thing to, to think. And cache hit ratios are super helpful in telling us whether caching is actually effective. Uh, and we have to remember there are actually two caches. There's your content addressable storage and your action cache. And when we typically talk about cache hit ratios, we're talking about how many actions we didn't have to rerun in a build. Uh, but it's important to understand the telemetry behind that. And you actually have multiple writes to successfully cache an action result, and you have multiple reads to successfully read an ac a cached action result. So it's important that your cache is highly available and very, very low error uh, rates. Uh, so that you actually get uh, effectiveness out of your cache. Um, if just one of those things fails, uh, you know you can do enough with retries, but at the end of the day, your, your cache has to be super, super reliable. So the way we actually go about this is uh, profiling. So Bazel has profiling built in. Uh, it's a pretty awesome feature. Uh, with the data it provides, you can reconstruct a full execution trace of an invocation down to each individual action, uh, plus some extra little details. So this gives us that peek inside the box that we want for timing information. Um, it gives us super low granularity. We can actually tell where a Bazel build spends most of its time, uh, including designation on whether something is on the critical path. Um, this is a very important thing to track. So in our private fork of Bazel, we also enable profiling of remote cache operations along with the content hashes of those actual requests being made. So every cache check, read, and write is included. And from this, we can easily calculate cache hit ratios. But we can also record the content hash of these requests and learn if particular blobs are unexpectedly not you know, coming out when we run tests when we expect them to actually be cached. It's also worth noting that we're you know, using the binary format in this example here. Uh, we are just now starting to transition to the new JSON format, which is way easier to use. Uh, if, you know, unless you've gone through the trouble of figuring out how to re like, natively decode the binary format of a profile, you have to run Bazel to, uh, to get any use out of it. Um, and you do that with the analyze profile command. So using profiling directly for individual invocations is sort of how we started out with this, and it's pretty straightforward, uh, as you saw with the commands before. But we want to use this to collect metrics more broadly in an automated fashion. 
Uh, we want to be able to do analyses offline and maybe even develop new metrics over time. So at the very least, we need a central data store to query these things that we record, and we should keep just a copy of the raw profile data. Unfortunately, Bazel doesn't have anything like the Bazel event service uh, with the event protocol built in, so we kind of have to build this ourselves. Uh, luckily, we already wrap our Bazel in a script, um, so this is not an uncommon thing. Uh, you know, basically, we have this tools Bazel thing in our, in our repo, which is a script that then calls the real Bazel. Um, but before we actually call it, we do some setup stuff, and one of those things is uh, building a profile, um, designated a profile to output, and then waiting for the command to finish, and then uploading that profile. So when we upload the profile, we also record some metadata about where that invocation was run. So we record some things like command line, host name, number of CPU cores, the OS version. Uh, and we upload this profile to a uh, Google Cloud Storage bucket, and uh, we record the metadata in BigQuery. From there, we can process the profile online um, at our leisure and run any number of aggregations we want, but we also throw the raw action data back in BigQuery as well. Uh, so we have a few tables, and everything is basically joined together, uh, if we need to, with an invocation ID. So we can you know, go down to the level of individual invocations if we need to. So what can we do with this data? Um, there are actually a lot of questions we can answer with this data. Here's just a few examples, uh, and we go from very broad to very specific. Uh, so we obviously want to be able to see a build time distribution. Uh, again, that's the number one thing we care about. Uh, so we can go in with the power of SQL and BigQuery. We can build out these distributions with various percentiles and track them over time. Uh, then we can get down to the level of users. Uh, so we can pretty easily track like host names to users in our organization. And so we can limit the metrics and bucket per user and see, okay, what's like the 90th percentile of all these users' builds? And who are the users that are having the worst time building? Uh, not everybody complains, so it's pretty, it's pretty good to be able to proactively identify these people. Uh, and so we can go and reach out to them and say, hey, why are builds taking so long? Can we help you out? Uh, we can also go down to the level, like I said, of individual invocations. And we can figure out things, again, why a test run might have you know, a, a cache miss on something. We should expect that if we built something immediately prior, that everything that we need to run that test is, is already ready to go. So now we're going to talk about how we actually made things faster. Uh, a lot of this isn't going to be super novel, uh, but the thing I like to stress here is optimizations take time. Uh, and the fun thing about upper management is they love to know how long things are going to, are going to take before you start doing it. Uh, so if nothing else, maybe you'll come away with at least one example of how long some of this stuff takes. So you can have a little bit of ammunition when you go and try to sell this to some of your stakeholders. So it's still late 2018. Uh, we've got these new fancy metrics to help guide us. Uh, since the initial migration of Bazel, uh, we've matured a bit in our setup. That, that box in the office under Nico's desk uh, is now an actual you know, service on real server hardware hosted on-prem. Uh, so we're not limited by you know, the small bandwidth on, the, on that network interface on that little thing. Uh, and for CI, we've, moose, we've moved most of our workflow to uh, Google Cloud, so we can actually just leverage Google Cloud Storage to use for our CI cache. There's no implementation there. It natively implements the API. Uh, there's also no operational overhead, so we can get rid of you know, what was running in AWS on a single machine. These things are mostly good, but we know we can do better. Um, we haven't done a whole lot of work to, to, to get to this point. Uh, so most of the improvements for build and test up to this point were actually focused on CI. Um, a lot of that was not Bazel specific because we had a pretty complex CI setup. And so local developers are kind of still hurting with their local workflow. Uh, builds can still take up to an hour and even more. Uh, 
Uh, some teams keep around log live branches, which is pretty fun, and they don't build on them frequently. Uh, so you often get messages and saying, hey, I'm building this ancient branch and it's taking forever. Uh, this is problematic uh, you know, when their code gets out of date and you know, they probably just wipe out their local state because they're building you know, maybe, you know, there are probably weeks between when they're, when they're building these things. Uh, and so our remote cache, the local developer cache, doesn't have enough storage to actually keep their inputs in there the whole time. Um, this is actually some repeat stuff. Uh, so the most efficient way we solved some of these problems was by using compression with our remote caching. So uh, we decided on Z standard compression uh, and found out with some basic testing that a fully cached build was actually 40% faster. Uh, it also allowed us to store about six times as much data in that on-prem cache. So those teams with the long-lived branches can now keep their stuff in there. They can go about a month in between builds and still have fully cached builds. Uh, and we get the obvious speed benefit. So it's important to know there are some trade-offs to make here, though. Uh, nothing's free. Uh, for one, you have to trade CPU time for transport time in this. So while we're transferring, transporting way less over the wire, uh, it does take some time to encode and decode these blobs. Uh, in our case, we were already I.O. bound, so that's totally fine. We have some spare C CPU cycles. Uh, but it's just something to consider if you want to do something similar like this yourself. Uh, just make sure that you're not going to actually have a regression. Um, so remote caching is great and all. Uh, it's still kind of limited in that it only prevents you from repeating yourself. So it's most effective when changes are pretty small and incremental. Uh, it's in our case, we saw it's really easy to invalidate a large portion of your cache. Uh, this comes in the form of changing common dependencies uh, or you know, making large refactors. Uh, and we also have some code paths in our, in our code base where it's pretty easy to car cause large unexpected invalidations of the cache. Uh, some of these things we thought maybe we could refactor and we dig into the code and find out, no, it's actually not that simple. Uh, so. The lesson here is caching isn't a one-size-fits-all solution for performance. Uh, at a certain point, you need to make the actual execution part faster. So enter remote execution. Um, before, we had kind of done things by just giving people more cores on their desktops. Uh, and of course, like any you know, distributed systems engineer realizes like you can't vertically scale forever. Uh, so with remote execution, you effectively give your Bazel client access to as many cores as are on your worker pool. Uh, so we had these beefy desktops with 28 core CPUs, which are great, uh, but nothing compares to what you can get with the cloud. So with so many workers available, it's trivial to also run a single test like 1,000 or even 100,000 times to detect super low flake rates in seconds or minutes. Uh, before that would take you know, probably over an hour to do some, to do that with some of our tests, uh, and to the point where we'd probably never detect flakiness in some of these things. I think we actually had an example where uh, an engineer ran something about 100,000 times and found five failures. Uh, like that would have been possible without without RB. So because each action runs on its own worker inside a Docker container, it also can't conflict with local resources on other tests. We actually had some of our tests that were marked as exclusive because we're like, hey, they're snapping on each other. We need to just separate them. So what exclusive does is it actually moves all those test executions to the end and then runs them all serially. Uh, not, not great for performance. So lastly, we can also share the same cache between developers and CI. Uh, before, we had this separate cache where you know, we don't want developers to share the CI cache because if you're editing code while you're interacting with cache and running builds, you can risk poisoning things. And we never want that to happen in CI or automated systems because that can cause huge, huge pain. Um, we don't have that problem anymore because you can't edit the code while it's running on the worker. So remote execution sounded great. Uh, we realized it was going to be a pretty big undertaking, though. Uh, and so we needed to take a step back and consider how we can provide value in a time-effective manner. Again, we're, we're four engineers. Uh, 
so with any distributed system, the operational overhead is non-zero. Uh, we figured we don't want to spend a bunch of time building and operating the system when maybe somebody else has already at least done the building part. Uh, and if we can avoid the operational part too, then we can focus on the problems that you know, we are best suited to solve as engineers of our company. So the other problem is developers were feeling a bit more pain during local development. Uh, CI is still good enough. Uh, the, the real bad part is local builds still take a long time. And that's the beginning of the development cycle. So there weren't, uh, yeah, again, there weren't any complaints about CI. Uh, there were some, just not as many. Uh, and so CI was also sort of changing at this time in our company, uh, and we didn't want to add too many changes in the mix at once, so just not, not great timing. Uh, we also needed to make sure there were no cases of regression with local build time. Uh, we, again, unfortunately dug ourselves into a hole by giving developers these machines with 28 cores. Uh, so there's a threshold for like the number of targets that you build under which local execution is actually going to be faster. Uh, and if our you know, devs if have received our education well and not you know, doing basal build slash slash dot 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 all the time, uh, then that's going to be a pretty frequent case. And we also can't let builds fail due to availability issues of the remote executor. Uh, in the worst case, we should at least be able to just revert back to how things were before. Um, at least it works. Slow but operational is better than not operational at all. And most importantly, we needed to include our developers in validating this. We need a way to let them easily opt in and opt out of using remote execution so they can give us feedback but still stay productive the whole time, uh, even if things go, go broken or on fire. Uh, because of this, we came up with a small list of requirements. Uh, we need to use a, host, a hosted service. Um, at this time, Google RBE was available for, uh, for use. Uh, we hear Google's pretty good at building software, uh, and we're already in GCP, so it seemed like a pretty good fit. Uh, to ensure forward progress, we needed to enable local fallback in case the remote execution environment was experiencing issues. And we also needed to enable dynamic scheduling. Uh, so what dynamic scheduling does is it effectively launches an action and executes it locally and remotely at the same time. And whichever finishes first wins. So this solves our case of not having build time regressions with uh, small numbers of targets when building locally. So in order to gradually move into things, we realized we could break this migration down into two phases. Uh, let's separate builds and tests. Uh, there's a big difference between two. Uh, b like Builds are a little bit different than actually executing the code that you're building. Uh, and we know we had some non-hermetic tests. Uh, just making builds faster was also going to be a huge win for our devs. Uh, that's really what they do a lot and sometimes just use these assets in other ways. Um, so. Initial setup to enable builds for a beta audience was pretty straightforward. Um, we got our RB instance set up. Uh, we configured a remote, remote platform with Docker. Uh, and we had an image that contained all the tools. We needed, we needed to build our code base. And then we invited our users to try it out. Uh, we gave them a way to opt in with a simple config option. They would just pass dash dash config equals RBE and they'd be able to then try out remote execution and give us feedback through a channel that we set up. And so from that, we got a lot of user error reports um, on little things that didn't work, um, or we got a lot of error reports on the same thing that didn't work, just in different ways. Um, and in addition to getting this direct user feedback, we also set up an extra step in our CI job that shadowed our existing build step uh, but using this RBE configuration. So from this, we could make an apples to apples comparison with real builds that succeeded in CI but failed remotely. Uh, and then we could basically dig into the logs and pinpoint issues uh, and see what was actually going on. Uh, most of the issues we experienced were actually due to the dynamic scheduler. Uh, this wasn't surprising. We knew there were some issues with it. Luckily, this was uh, fixed upstream right around the time we were wrestling with this, and we were able to backport that fix into our version. Um, so 
from that, we kind of then released builds to everybody. Um, and then for this entire process, basically, of going from planning to actually enabling remote builds by default for all the devs took about two months. Um, and after that, our builds were about five times faster. Uh, and I think that was in the worst case. Um, so people were pretty happy with it. So next, next phase, we've got to enable tests. So once all the builds are working, we've got to move on to enabling test execution RB. This is a lot trickier. Uh, many of our tests were not sandboxed. We knew this, uh, and they were just not hermetic. So tracking down these instances of non-hermeticism had to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, there's, there's really no magic here. You just kind of have to do the work uh, and dig in and figure it out. Uh, we also had flaky tests that were still around. Uh, this prevented us from reliably caching tests. Uh, so while we were already paying off tech debt, we figured why not go in and try to fix these flaky tests. Um, we also have tests that require GPUs. Again, that, that fun hardware requirement. So we, they weren't quite ready yet in, in RBE uh, when we started doing this. So sort of a small question mark, but we were fine with it because we can just filter those tests out. They're all, they're all labeled with tags, and so we can just query them out when we run them. Um, I won't bore you with all the details of making non-hermetic tests hermetic. Uh, these things are kind of going to be specific uh, to our use case, and if you have to solve the same problem, it's going to be the same for you. Uh, what I will say is that something like Tools Remote is a totally invaluable tool. Um, in this process, it is your friend. Uh, if you find issues with running stuff in remote execution and want to reproduce them locally, this is the way to do it. So overall, this took about four months for tests, um, and that's including getting the GPUs. Uh, we eventually got support for GPUs in RBE, which was awesome. Uh, getting that set up once we had all the other tests running was pretty low effort. Um, a really cool thing about that, too, is we have to support uh, multiple types of GPUs when we're transitioning hardware platforms. Uh, so with the power of macros, we can just take the same test and then split it up and say, hey, let's run it on this platform and this platform at the same time. And it's RB, so they run in parallel. Um, also, we were able to like, completely remove the exclusive tests. Um, those things are completely isolated on workers now, so they can't stomp on each other. Uh, so that gets rid of that whole you know, long tail of all these things that are, that are finishing at the end after you've already executed all your tests. Um, we were also to, again, use RBE to detect incredibly low flake rates in our tests. Uh, so again, you can run these things a 1,000 times, 100,000 times, and be like, yep, it actually is flaky. Uh, we wouldn't have known this otherwise. So we were able to get rid of these flakes, and now we can actually reliably cache our tests, uh, bringing test times down even more. So we've got builds and tests working on RB now, uh, fully onboarded. Uh, things are great. What lessons did we learn from this process, though? Uh, first and foremost, RBE service is great. Uh, it's been incredibly stable for us, and it's allowed a team of small engineers like us to actually focus on the problems that are specific to our company, and we are more suited to solve. Um, we can let the other people that have already built these great products do the heavy lifting. Uh, we definitely don't regret pushing to solve the harder problem of uh, developer builds first. Um, getting this stuff on a CI was just trivial after we got all these hard problems solved with devs. Um, and then basically you get all of the same benefits in CI that you get locally for, for free. Uh, and it was also great because our devs could immediately see the impacts, uh, you know, gradually releasing these, these things out from the beta group to actually releasing everybody. Uh, you know, we got a lot of messages of people saying, wow, this is incredible. I haven't built this repo in weeks, and I just pulled it down and built it in five minutes. Um, that's, that's an incredibly powerful thing when it used to take like an hour. Um, it's also important to understand the difference between building your code remotely and testing it remotely. 
Uh, one of these things may be significantly harder than the others. Uh, if you haven't paid a lot of attention to your tests, uh, targets have, as they've developed over time, um, if you haven't ensured that they are hermetic, then you will find out uh, when you try to go into remote execution. Uh, so just get ready to pay off tech debt if you're not sure about that. Uh, it's worth it, but understand that it does take some time. So with all that, there is still more to do. Uh, we have changing hard requirements for, for tests all the time, and we won't actually be able to always satisfy them with what's available in the cloud. Um, we'd like to eventually integrate some on-prem hardware uh, with the system. There, it's, it's possible. There are multiple ways that we're thinking about doing this, um, but we want to build something for the long term. Um, and again, we don't want to have to maintain all of this infrastructure um, all the time. We'd rather be able to move on and solve other problems because now that builds are fast, devs are actually asking us to do other things. Um, and efficiency is something we're starting to care about too. Uh, so great, things are fast. Um, we need to sort of like maximize the return on our, on our investment here uh, and sort of like squeeze the performance out of it. We have really spiky workloads. Um, so a lot of time at when we're you know at peak capacity with our worker pools uh, and remote execution, we're not using a lot of that stuff. Uh, so some basic things we've done are like time-based also going actually saves us a ton of money, um, but we'll have to go further from there. Um, another thing is we're doing C++ compilation, single-threaded. Uh, some of it actually takes a lot of memory. So doing you know getting like single-core machines with a lot of memory isn't really a thing you can do in the cloud. So we have to figure out how to sort of you know, accurately use uh, the right machines uh, to do those things. Uh, all solvable problems, uh, but it's something we need to sort of like sink our teeth into and, and figure out. So if you want to help us solve any of these problems, we're also hiring. Um, it's worth mentioning. Um, and with that, thank you. I think we have some time for questions. <clears throat> Thanks so much. As always, questions. We'll give a few seconds for people to hop on stage. OK, well, there we are. Hop on the mic. Um, hi, Sir, I'm Sergio from Lucid Software. Um, so I'm wondering, when you were saying that to measure the performance of Basil, you were using the profiler. Um, does that mean you were using the profile on every invocation of Basil that any dev was doing on their workstations? Yes. Did you see any significant performance impact from that? Not really. Uh, it was kind of hard be to think about that because it was sort of a chicken and egg problem because right. we're like, what is, what is the performance already? Um, so it's something we kind of want to take a step back and look into. Um, but yeah, we, there's no hard answer for that. I, I uh, guess, did you encounter like suddenly developers being like, hey, like, why are things taking a bit longer? No, definitely not. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, if there's no more questions, let's thank uh, Michael and Nico. Thanks for coming out. Super interesting. Thanks. It's all good.